Thank you, everybody. Good evening. We shall go on in English uh, for the good and better understanding from each one another here tonight. Well, my first question for you, Rob Riemann. Are you still a European uh, believer or a Euro enthusiast? Um, I would love to be European. I aspire to be European, but the key thing is that, in my perception, to be a European has nothing to do with the EU. In fact, I think we should sue the EU, get them to court, and to make sure that they will not use the term Europe anymore, because basically it's nothing else than an economic union. And a lot of misunderstanding of you know, what Europe is all about is because this economic union is supposed to be a European Union, but it has nothing to do with what Europe is all about. It's one of the problems we are facing now. So that's the first thing. Let's make sure that the economic union will call themselves just be an economic union. This, this presentation was about an economic union. It had nothing to do with Europe. And if we can get this misunderstanding out of uh, the air, then we finally can talk about Europe and get to young people and students and make them clear what it means to be a European. Same for you, Jacques Attali. Is there still, for you, a European spirit? <laughs> there may become one day a European spirit. It's not real for the moment. But um, it has to appear. Um, there are long a lot of things that have been said before, right? I should first uh, uh, think I need to comment. First, I want to thank Michel and uh, Mr. Askin to have organized this uh, meeting based on my book and this wonderful exhibition that is in charge. And second, uh, I would like to make uh, some small comments about what mm -hmm. have been said. Not to play as a professor correcting what has been said, but just to complete. First, about uh, the impact of religion on the nature of Europe. I was surprised that uh, if uh, Christianism was mentioned, Judaism was not. Because there is no Christianism without Judaism, and Judaism is at the basis of what Europe is about. And uh, Europe is first a dialogue between Judaism and Greece, which gave birth, among many other things, to Christianism, not to be forgotten because it's at the core of the definition of Europe. Because the dialogue between Judaism and um, Greece led to one fundamental idea, the idea of unity. One, one God, one reason, one cause, one science. And that's the real, in my view, fundamental principle of what is the Western world. And after all, there is no Western world except Europe, because America is just a kind of European utopia which is succeed. Therefore, the idea of Europe is the idea of unity, one, which is good in us for many reasons, but also have a lot of uh, other uh, bad dimensions, which is when you try to be one, you try to unify, then you, you, you do not accept the diversity, you do, do not accept the nuances, you want to conquer, you want to be, uh, and it's why when St. Paul said neither Jews nor Greek, that means that we are both of them and we are global. That's the core of Europe. Europe wants to be one at the beginning and make the, one, the world as one based on our conception of it, which is unity of everything as a cause and as a final aim. Second uh, remarks on what has been said in terms of trends. I'm surprised that you did not mention uh, the fact that uh, I, I did totally disagree with what Mr. Spack said, because not only uh, it's, a, it's a Belgium point of view that would like to see that the other nations are as small as Belgium, even if I speak things that Belgium is not a small country, and instead of thinking that all nations small, we should think of all nations great. 
And I do think that Belgium has a future as a great nation, as well as France, as well as Germany and others. And I think we are not going to build the unity on Europe on the death of nations and not building the future of Europe on the uh, uh, bashing of nations. If we do that, the only thing we'll get will be nationalism against Europe, which is exactly what is coming now. Please don't do that. Second, I will comment also on, on the demographic issue. In my view, what was missing in the presentation was the fact that there are also some problems in Europe in the relations between nations and there are problems in the world. If I have to remember only one figure about 2020, it would be the fact that in 2020, mankind will be 9 billion, 2 billion more than today, and out of the 2 billion, one will be in Africa. Africa will be 2 billion, and out of these 2 billion, one will be less than 18 years old. That's the core of our future. The 21st century is not going to be a century of Asia, it's going to be a century of Africa. Either for the best, if we get to succeed in seeing Africa to develop, or for the worst, if we see the whole of Africa coming to Europe. That's the most important question. Europe, in terms of demography, don't forget that if we see the figures, by the way, in 2050, there will be less citizens of United States than citizens of Nigeria. There will be, uh, of course, more Indian than Chinese, you have said, but there will be almost more Turkish than Russians. And if we follow the trends, more French than Germans. That's what is 2050 that we have to, to remember. Another dimension of 2050 that should rem be remembered in terms of demography is the mobility of population. In 2050, I, if we stay in the world where we are today, which is a world of freedom, of movement, of ideas, capitals, goods, we'll have mobility of persons. It's impossible to keep the mobility of capitals and goods if we don't have a mobility of persons or labor. Therefore, that means that in 2050, we'll have a lot more worldwide of movement of population. Today, 200 million people are living in another continent than the continent they were born. It will be at minimum 500 in 2050. So we it's not a crisis, it's a, it's a opportunity, what we are living now. Of course now. it is an opportunity. As Europeans, we, we see our population declining. Of course, our population is going, the chance of our, our future is to see the migration to Europe, to swallow other population, to integrate them. That's the chance of Europe. Don't forget that all European nations have as a name the name of invaders, all European nations. And then we should be happy to that if we are able to organize it. If not, what is the most important question of Europe today? It is the fact that if we do not accept or face this wonderful future that we have for technology, the, 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 the new uh, comers in terms of, of uh, uh, migrations and the fact that we could create a, the best place in the world to live. Where is best to live in the world? Europe, more than anywhere else, of course. Don't be European bashings. We, we live better here than in the US, better here than anywhere else in the world. We have to protect that. And it's the reason why people are voting by moving to come to Europe. And if we want to protect that, we have to think about it as, a, as a being proud of what we do. And being proud of what we do means being proud of Europe. And I, for the sake of argument, I would totally disagree with my friend Rod, Rob. European Union is a proxy of Europe. Of course, it's not the ideal of Europe, but it is Europe. We don't have better than, than that. It's Europe. It's economic Europe, but economic Europe is the first dimension of the future. Through economic Europe, we are going to build, if we are consistent, political Europe. There is no sustainability of the euro without a European treasury. There is no European treasury without a parliament voting on the budget. And later on, we, as we face this question of migrants, we will need uh, a common defense and a common security policy. And we therefore are proxy by proxy 
building a political Europe, not by destroying the nations, but above the nations. No way to do it differently than for what we have. Because we face, and I will end up like that, we, we face a moment which is exactly the moment that we already faced in Europe in 1780 and in 1910, which is a moment where it was possible to build unity of Europe, and we, dis we choose another way. In 1780, we choose the, the way of the wars between nations, and that was 20 years of wars, which gave birth to Belgium, by the way. And then, in 1910, there was also a wonderful period where it was possible to reach a moment where um, it was possible to have a global unity, it was a time of amazing optimism, technology, democracy, etc. And because of a crisis, we choose protectionism, and it was 75 years of obscurantism. It's exactly the moment we face today. Either we will be bold enough to look at 2020 as a wonderful future in terms of unity, which is the core of a European DNA, or we go back to obscurantism for 75 years. May I that, oh, of course, that's a lot of things. I, I would like to have, of course, your ideas to that, because your first book was also a nobility of spirit, mm -hmm. and in that you, you were a very fan, fan so, so I tell from the European humanism, is there still a response in that European humanism? Well, I mean, listen, and, and I admire Jacques Attali, and he's a friend. Um, but you forgot to ask one very profound question. And if you ask that question, you will realize why your fantasy about the EU will not work, and why it's much more predictable that the EU will fall apart than that it will stay together. And that is, and the question is, the unity of what? What will unify us? So this was a question I addressed 10 years ago to a Dutch European commissioner, Mr. Bolkestein. He was then European commissioner, and he gave a lecture on what it means to be European, but it was very vague, nobody understood anything of it. So I asked him, I said, look, you're a European commissioner. Please tell us what makes us a European. Then we know. And he took out um, his passport. This is not my passport. But he took out his passport. He said, everybody with a passport of an EU member state is a European because of that passport. Now, this was October 2004, so only a couple of months after 10 new countries entered, and those people from Poland, Hungary, Romania said to Bolkestein, but we are only European since the 1st of May, because before that time we didn't have that passport. It was for me the big eye-opener how Brussels, quote-unquote, thinks. It thinks in passports. If you want to know the future of Europe, we have to go back to the past, because there were some you know, extremely intelligent people who made some predictions a long time ago, which unfortunately all became true. Let's go back 150 years ago to Nietzsche. Young Nietzsche, 26 years old, professor, gives a lec five lectures on the future of education. In his lectures, 150 years ago, he already said, my students, I pity you, because the school of civilization has been taken away from you. You will only be educated in what's good for the economy and what's good for a bureaucracy, nothing else. This was 150 years ago. It was the first prediction of the organized stupidity, what is nowadays called education. Fast forward, Ortega y Cassette in the 20s already made the analysis. We are not living in democracy, we're living in a mass democracy. And a mass democracy is something which can develop into totalitarianism, which it did, and it's easily, it can be done again. Then in 1920, Musil gives a lecture on helpless Europe. He says, look, the world of humanism is gone by. We are now living in the, in the technological age, and I have no clue whatsoever what that will mean, how it will, how it will keep our civilization together. This was 1921. In 1946, Rencontre Internationale in Geneva, Jean Guivineau, Julien Bendin, Denis de Rougemont, and they all spoke about the fact, I mean, Stephen Spender said that he was there as well. He said it pretty clearly. He said, look, 
Europe is facing the danger that it will all become a museum, which it is, at least for many Americans and people from China, and a bank, which is also true. Why? Because we lost the spirit of Europe. And so the only thing, and I know you will agree with me, the only thing that really can unite us is not economic interest, which is the fantasy of the EU here. Because the EU is not spending any money on education. They do not know how to spell the word culture. They, do not, they cannot even spell the word l'esprit or, or soul or whatever. All these things don't exist here in Brussels. Brussels is based on economic interest, but economic interest will never be able to unify us. Europe is based on political values, well, now and then. That Hungary already became an official fascist state is okay with them. That Mr. Orban can say, well, you know, we can't have those refugees because we are a Christian nation. I mean, listen, the EU cannot do anything against Mr. Putin. Putin is the official leader of the fascist world. He's spending money on Le Pen, on Mr. Wilders, and so on and so forth. The EU keeps silence on all these issues. So the political betrayal and the political hypocrisy is already there as well. It can only be what Nietzsche understood perfectly well. It has to be what then Patoshka repaid later, and what Vaclav Havel understood so well. It has to be the cultivation of the human soul, which is what culture is. Cultura animi philosophia est. Culture comes from the notion, cultura animi, the cultivation of the soul, which is philosophy. This is the thing which has been taken away of education. This is the thing which has been taken away of youngsters. This is the reason why you will not get 1,000 people to go on the street and say, to say, je suis européen. But you can have millions of people to go on the street to say, je suis Charlie. The political class, this Europe, this European Commission will not solve anything because they do not understand what the problems are. This is, not, uh, this, is an, this is not a new phenomenon, this is an old thing. You know, Jatana Moscow already wrote on the ruling class, and the ruling class is always an expression of the society as it is. So if we talk about the society in crisis, the ruling class is the exponent of the crisis. They will not solve the crisis, they are the crisis. We can only solve things when more and more young people start to understand, A, that the EU has nothing to do with Europe, that it is an economic union, when they will start to realize that the, that the educational system is one form of betrayal and only making them fit for some business world or for uh, some uh, uh, bureaucracy, and that we have to give them the world of culture and philosophy back, as you are doing with your works. That's the thing to be done. And if we, and if we keep on thinking of, you know, that, that all will go well, and it's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. It will not work. I mean, this whole prediction of 2050, that has nothing to do with Europe. It has nothing to do with Europe. But just on, if it goes on the right side, we will have a, a form of fascism back all over Europe, which is possible. If it goes on the other side, we will all come trapped in this fantasy of science and technology, and that science and technology will fix everything. Well, already Wittgenstein knew that that was not true. So. You know, we, we have to think through these things and we have to start thinking about, you know, what will unify us. Okay, that's a good question. It's also the question from, well, it's not, not a kind of prophecy, but it's a question, what, what's the future for European youth? Well, I want to continue to tease my friend, Rob, but uh, I always think that, and more and more today, that we are free behavior in front of... Uh, political action. One is to say, it was better before, let's go back. It is your behavior. The second will say, it was not better before, it's not going to be better later, let's play as it is. It is the behavior of almost all politicians. And there's another behavior who says, it can be better in the future, let's do it. It's my behavior. It can be better in the future, let's do it. I don't believe that, Rob, that it was better in the past. I don't believe that... I didn't say so. You said that. No. Exactly you said that. It was no. implicit in all your words. 
because you thought it was better. I said they had a better understanding. No, the, well, a better understanding. Said it was but better. The, the ruling class yeah. always has been the ruling yeah, class. He said it was I mean, better. World War I and World II came me. from something, right? Okay. First, uh, it was not better. It was not, even in terms of a, your own field of competence, your main field of competence, which is philosophy. It was not better, far from that. How many people were studying philosophy in the 20s? in terms of ratio of, of, of uh, generation, 20 times less than today. And of course, we are much better, more important, more clever but philosopher doesn't... today than it was 50 years ago. Don't forget about it, there's a huge increase. Don't say that it's worse today than it was in the past. And even if you can name a, a, a huge number of uh, former philosopher, you can have a lot of new young people which are creating amazing things today. Second, in, you said economics is not good. I don't want to see that as a corporatism of a philosopher saying that his profession is not at the center of the future, which could be seen for what you said. But I, I don't use that as an argument. But the, the, the reality is that if you build on the fact that economics is not the, what is important, okay, let's forget about it. Let's get rid of the economic union, and what do we have? We come back to nations. We get rid of the euro, and then we are going to go to new wars between European nations. If we don't continue to build a European entity through what we have, which is economics, in less than 20 years after the end of the euro, we'll have a new war between France and Germany because nations will come back, and if nations come back, they'll come back with all their devils, which is war. Therefore, we are bound to succeed to go through that road, from economics to social, from social to politics, from politics to culture. We are bound to do it, because we are embarked into a very specific um, attempt, which is, for the second time in mankind history, to build a nation bottom-up. All nations have been built from a conqueror. Conqueror coming, build a nation, take a territory and build a nation. That's easy. We tried that in Europe many times, nightmares. We try bottom up. It's a long process. When I say it the second time, because someone else did it before, the Swiss. Switzerland has been built bottom up. And that me me leads me to my answer to your question, Rob. You said, uh, unity for what? Unity is always against a threat. Always. That's the nature of, we, fret, we are afraid of something, and we fight for something, and therefore we are unit against a threat. What was the threat that get birth, give birth to European Union? I speak on, under the control of uh, Stevie, of, who is here, who knows better than anyone else what was a threat at that time. But the threat, in my view, at the moment of the creation of Europe, were two threats. One, the threat of being invaded by the Soviet Union, and the second, the threat of being abandoned by the US. And then we unite because we are afraid of both. Today, not only we are not anymore afraid of being abandoned by the US, but a lot of people are, would be happy if the US get rid of them, that we get rid of them. And even if some people are fancying that Russia could be a threat, nobody believes anymore that there is a Russian threat. And therefore, the real problem of Europe is that we have to build something without a threat. Some people are trying to build the migrant as a threat, which is crazy, and that will only create destruction of Europe to see that threat as a way to, con to destroy Europe and not to build Europe, but to rebuild the nations on a very bad basis. What is a threat? The threat is, the real threat of Europe is something that we could argue together, but it should be a really a much more interesting debate. The threat for Europe is to be uh, overdrawn by globalization. And that through globalization, we Europeans, we lose our identity, our diversity, our way of living, our music, our gastronomy, our philosophy, our literature, to be uh, into a united world without new specificity. And then what we have to build in Europe 
is to build Europe as, a re, re, as an answer to the threat of too much globalization. I think this is, a, this is what could be understood as a way to consider that if we build that Europe under this basis, we will protect what we Europeans bring to the world, which is something very specific, unique, not superior to the others, but different. We are different from Asia, from Africa, from other continents, and we have to build that. And this is only when we have a consciousness of this threat of being only a, an appendix not to Asia, but an appendix to America, which is our threat. A real threat is not to be an appendix to Asia, to be an appendix to the US. If we keep our capacity to be ourselves, then it's a, it's a fascinating challenge. Rob Riemann, I would like, your, of course, you to answer those mm -hmm. interpolations, but also with that point of view, your second book was The Eternal Return of Fashion. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a, so, a kind of auto-regulated prophecy. Uh, well, okay. Uh, Let's think yeah. it, there will be an eternal return. Okay, Mr. Orban seems to be a, a, a good kind of that. But um, is the, the, the way to, 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 to submit it, is, is that not Europe? Europe will build an anti-fascism? No? Okay, so anyway, three points I want to make. First, um, as you know all too well, economy can never unite people. This was already you know, was stated by our famous historian Johan Huizinga. Economy is always good, better to divide people because we'll always be rich and poor and there's always this element of resentment, it's always there. Like politics. So Huizinga said, you know, a culture has to have a metaphysical dimension or it will not be a culture. You cannot dismiss the metaphysical dimension if you want to unite people. That's the professor of theology that's speaking now. Oh, well, or, or just common sense. Um, the other point I want to make is that, of course, there will be great new philosophers, um, and I'm happy to meet them. Um, but I still have some faith in, in Socrates and Spinoza, who were not bad either. And uh, they would profoundly disagree with you in terms of that to be united, we need a threat. What they explained is that the quintessence of human identity is based not on what divides us from the others, but what we have on a universal level in common. This is the essence of European humanism. And this brings me to the other point, and that is, well, you know, look, I'm, I'm not a conservative. In many ways, I'm against conservatism because of the social injustice. But you cannot defy the fact that something fundamentally changed in our value system. And no, I don't want to make a plea for Christianity or Judaism or, or whatever. But a Vaclav Havel could say that the credo of European humanism is the capacity to live in truth to create beauty and to do justice. That's not the kind of values we are giving to the new generation. They are taught to be competitive, efficient, how to fix things, to be positive, uh, to appreciate what's new because it's new, and so on and so forth. They are trained to become a consultant or whatever. So we had a profound change in our value system for reasons you know much better than I do because you wrote the most wonderful books about it. It has to do with the Shoah. It has to do with the betrayal of Christianity. It has to, but it also has to do with what Nietzsche said, the school of civilization is no longer there. And then on the return of uh, uh, fascism, I didn't uh, uh, invent that. It was both Albert Camus and Thomas Mann who in 1947, after World War II, said, don't make the mistake. World War II is over, but fascism did not disappear. And why should it disappear? Because all the phenomena which gave rise to fascism are still with us, and we see it by the day. And so, we see the resentment, and the resentment is growing. We notice that the political elites lost all moral authority, all, 
basic idea hated. In the United States, it's obvious, but also here in Europe is the case. And so this resentment and the sense of crisis is now used by demagogues like Mr. Wilders, Le Pen, we can go through the whole, uh, all put in. And what is it? It's the politics of lies, it's the politics of hatred, it's the politics of fear. And, you know, the only thing they can offer is, um, is fascism. And so there's an, an, at least we should acknowledge this because, and in this respect I agree with you, my nightmare would be indeed if the EU would not hold. Because if that happens, then indeed we are right back, not even the 30s, beginning of the 40s, for sure. But the EU can only hold together if we have a complete different set of mind and if we have a complete different set of people in which, and then we will have a European Commission in which the Commissioner for Culture and Education is the most prominent one and not who is doing with competition and that kind of stuff. Should we begin with culture? First, uh, I'm sorry to say that I agree with what you said. Uh, and first, uh, <laughs> I, I would advise anyone in this room which has not yet read, uh, read the uh, Return of Fascism to read it and to have read it by your children because it's a fundamental book. It has a, on, also the characteristic of being only 60 pages and I'm a great fan of his book which is really a tool for fighting against the Return of Fascism in Europe. Please read it in any languages and I'm happy to recommend it around the world. I, 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 <coughs> education uh, is of course a must, but first education is more than ever and has to stay a privilege of nations, not of a European entity, because it has to be done in different languages and therefore if there is only one competence that to stay to a government, it would be education even at the moment of Europe. Therefore, I, I didn't, do not say that education should not be the first. In my view, in any, in, in, in any reform program, the first thing to be looked at is what we do for children at the age of three. And uh, when I work for reform programs in France, my first proposal was about uh, not economics, not uh, whatever it was, reform of the education for young people at the age of... I do believe it's fundamental, but in my view, it is not the competence of the Union because it has to stay at the national, a nation level because it's done in different languages, different cultures, etc. But for sure, it is, a, it is number one. What Europe can do is to propose uh, best practices, uh, exchanges. Uh, we have an Erasmus for students. Why not an Erasmus at a lower level? Lower level? Why not an Erasmus for vocational schools, etc. Et that, that's for sure, it's fundamental. But in my view, what will unite Europe is not education. It's a dream. A dream. Uh, we speak of, a Europe, of an American dream. And people are, Americans are proud to speak of an American dream. If you speak of a French dream or a Belgian dream, people are laughing. It doesn't mean anything. That's a, that's a shame that we are laughing when we speak of a Belgium dream or a French dream or a Dutch dream or even of a European dream. Therefore, the role of, the, uh, of us uh, who try to think about Europe is to crystallize what could be a European dream. And it's not so difficult to, to make it appear. It's enough to compare that to the rest of the world. The rest of the world is a nightmare when we compare it to the paradise of what Europe is today. And Europe may become a nightmare of fundamentalism, of uh, lack of tolerance, etc. Et Therefore, the European dream is to build on what can be freedom, solidarity, altruism, uh, what I call selfish altruism, which is uh, the uh, best way of understanding good behavior for the future. If we can build on that and explain that the history of Europe with its barbarism, recent barbarism, and its success has led us with a feeling that we have built a society with 
the best individual freedom, the best balance between the right to, to have any kind of religion if it is private and to tolerate the religion of the other, the balance between uh, uh, social democracy and individual freedom, we are the best situ society in the world. Be proud of what we are. The, Amer the European dream is much better than any other dream in, in, in the world. It's the balance between freedom and altruism. And I think it's this balance, which is properly European, is really a, 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 a name for, the, for 2050. Mm -hmm. Is it so that, that selfish altruism uh, that Jack Attali named uh, a few seconds, in a few seconds, well, is that uh, a kind of building a spiritual uh, European dream? Is that our touch? The okay. I'll get back to your question. My fear is, I mean, I agree with you that we are still extremely privileged compared to the rest of the world. But we were also very privileged in 1912 and 1913. And suddenly, out of the blue, nobody expected that it. it was a great illusion, it was there. And there is no writing on the wall, this will never happen again, because we know now that these things can happen again. And that's my fear, that for, by a wrong perspective, these things are happening again. Now, you know the essay by George Steiner on the idea of Europe, which we published in 2004. George Steiner is, for many reasons, he's famous, but he's also famous for his quote, with the Shoah, with killing the Jews, Europe committed suicide. Europe committed suicide. And it committed suicide because it killed their own Europeans. The most outspoken, true Europeans of the Enlightenment were the European Jews. Try to imagine a world where we would, where we would not have had Nazis. What would Europe be? We did not learn the lessons of the past. We got trapped into our own nihilism. And the escape of our nihilism is a kitsch society, is technology, is economics, is all kinds of things which will never be able to make us a true civilized society. And we know that the world is waiting for us. Why is it that so many people from other regions now, from other traditions, from the Islam, cannot integrate in the kind of Europe which the people did from the shtetl? I think those people coming from the shtetl, for them there was a Europe of a Goethe, a Beethoven, a Kant, a Voltaire, and they could, we, we became in many ways a complete, empty and decadent society. And so, again, it's still not too late. I want to be an optimist. If I would be a pessimist, I would become a banker probably. Yes. But, there an, 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 but there are things to be done and we, and we are running out of time. We are running out of time and it would be quite foolish to put our cards on the kind of ruler class which is here. And if we talk about education, it has to be liberal education. And it has to be an education in the values that truly matter. But there was, well, oh, okay. this, this point on. is very important. Uh, could we build Europe or is it still, is it dead because we did a lot of mistakes in the past and the fact that it is now today an economic uh, entity makes impossible to uh, appropriate Europe because Europe is not anymore linked to, uh, to ideas. And you said that Islam are not integrating in Europe because there is no, 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 nothing to, to integrate. I don't agree. First, because um, if we see the Muslim populations, they integrate very well, except small number of people as everywhere. Remember what was said in Belgium about the Italians at the beginning of the 20th century, it's worse than what he said about 
Muslim today, about Jews, about Polish, etc. That's just a matter of time. And more than that. And we don't do that enough. And I, I was wrong not to mention it when I mentioned Judaism in order to add to the wonderful uh, speech of uh, our host on, on the dimension of religion. Islam. Islam is part of Europe. Islam was at the birth of Europe in the 7th century. One of the most important philosophers of Europe is a Muslim. It would be considered a Spanish today, but it's a Muslim, Ibn Rushd, fundamental thinker. And if we, in the European schools, have since a lot of time put Ibn Rushd in the, uh, as one of the most important pillars of education, it would be much easier for people coming from abroad to say, I am proud to be a European because my culture is also at the birth of Europe. When Ibn Rushd said, uh, uh, truth cannot contradict truth. He said everything about modernity, which means that even if you believe, you can go to science because science will never contradict truth of, of God because truth of God is, of course, embodying the truth of science. That is fundamental. Therefore, I do think that Islam is part of Europe. Therefore, no risk if we are realistic about the fact that Islam is a part of a European culture, no risk to see them out of it if we are able to say it openly. And then Europe has been the melting pot of so many different cultures that I don't see any reason not to continue to that. Of course, Europe was a place where we saw a lot of barbarism. And, and uh, the last one was, was the one you mentioned. But it did not happen only in Europe. It happened everywhere. It's not a European uh, uh, specialty. I mean, uh, we, we saw a lot of massacres in Africa, in Asia, uh, everywhere. It's a, it's, a, it's a dimension of human being, not a European condition. Therefore, I don't think we should over-criticize uh, ourselves on that. We are human beings, and in human beings, there are scapegoats, there are martyrs, there are terrorists, there are, all that exists, not, not specifically European. Therefore, I do think that Europe has a role to play in the future, which is linked exactly to that point. You said that economics cannot unite us. It's a fact that economics is uniting us worldwide, and that the the, the most important difficulty of today is that we have a global economics, a global markets, while we still have local politics, nations. And it's clear that as long as we have only a global economics and a local politics, global economics will dominate on local, local politics. We don't have local global politics, which means that we have global economics without global rule of law which means that it will be a chaos, and we leave that. Then the challenge of the next 50 years is, can we build a global rule of law at the world level? But if we are not able to build a global rule of law at the European level, no chance to do that at the world level. It's why we are, we European, pioneer of what should be done at the world level. We have been able to build a global economics in Europe through the common market and the economic union. And now we know, we have understood, we leave it, that an economic union is not sustainable without a European rule of law, which means a democracy or a European rule of law. If we are not able to do it in Europe, no chance to do that at world level, and it will destroy. It's why it's also our role as Europeans to be also the front runners, the vanguard, the leaders responsible for the whole of the world. We cannot fail. If we fail, the world will collapse in barbarism for the whole of the 20th, 21st century. Is there some kind of leadership still remaining for Europe tomorrow? Well, they, they told us uh, the American leadership will, uh, well, will fail down, fall down. And uh, is there renewal for European leadership and in which matter? In which matter? Well, well, well 
if you're talking about this present European Commission or uh, no. no 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 there isn't your no, no, kind of Europe no 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 an, 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 no but the, the interesting thing is this was already when you had this rencontre internationale of 1946 uh, uh, Jaspers given out Benda already said well the, the time of Europe is over they knew that I mean but at that time it was Russia and uh, America now it's China and America um, but I agree with uh, 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 Jacques. That Europe should become a leader. That, should, that, that Europe, in the sense that it has to accept a certain responsibility. What I disagree with is that, you know, it are the premises. Um, if again, if you keep telling us that economy, global economy, unite us. I mean, you have seen this picture of inequality. We know what is happening to the middle class. Uh, we know where the resentment is coming from. We also know where the financial crisis is coming from and what kind of deficit. We know about the figures of unemployment in the south of Europe and, and, and the rest. So it can't be the economy. It can't be neoliberalism. It can't be what we call casino capitalism. It used to be social democracy. But social democracy is gone. OK, well, you, you still have Michel Hollande, but that's it. There is no social democracy anymore. I mean, that's one of the things we have to think through. What happened? Again, my, my, my argument is that relates to a fundamental change in values. You talked about solidarity. You talked about responsibility. Um, well, but you know, that's no longer what key values are in nowadays society. If you go to um, the predictions of 2050, I was most shocked um, by the, the vision of what will happen with our technology. It was there, robots, transhumanism. Um, have we thought what that really implies? Do we understand the consequences of Ray Kurzweil's ideal of the singular man, when will all of us, at least that's their dream, will be a fusion between a computer and, and, and a human being. So, no, that will not help us. I mean, for me, that's a kind of nightmare. It can only help us if we get back, and I totally agreed with what you said about uh, the, the most, Islamic, uh, most important Islamic uh, philosopher. We have to rethink our fundamental values. We have to rethink what's the meaning of truth. We have to rethink what is freedom. We have to rethink what's the dignity of man all about. We have to, re and, and at the very moment we do that, then we can start thinking on, on what is, the two questions of Socrates, what is a good life and what is a good society? But the questions are not even addressed anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm not so pessimistic. Uh, uh, I have created some years ago a movement that we call Positive Economy, where we uh, gather around the world people which are working in the interest of next generations. And it is fascinating to see the number of people, young and not young, which are not anymore individualists, which are interested in helping the others, which are also rationally have understood that the best way to serve their own interest is to be altruistic because altruism is a condition of a most efficient selfishness. The what selfish is. altruism. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's fundamental, and it is not diminishing. On the contrary, it's growing. It's a growing ide ideology that we see through NGOs, through the uh, importance of political parties. By the way, social democracy is growing everywhere in the world, not diminishing. If you see, for instance, the criteria of a share of GDP which is going through government, you see that this, this figure is growing everywhere in the, in the world. It's not, not diminishing. And the, uh, the importance of movements, NGOs, associations, civil society, this is growing amazingly. Of course, there is also narcissism, individualism, but in my view, this is the ideology of the past. It's already finished. They may win because there is an alliance between fascism and advertisement. Both are, are saying, me first, me first. Marketing and fascism are exactly having the same ideology, me first. But this is the ideology of the past. Young people are more interested in altruism. And what is fascinating is that technology is pushing in the direction of altruism. 
what is collaborative economy? The fact that you understand that uh, you are better when you help, that together you can do better than alone. But tomorrow with transhumanism it will be a dialogue with robots. Transhumanism is a threat. It's a threat for 50 years from now we have to fight against it. But it's another kind of threat. It's a threat on the existing of human beings. That's for sure. But it's, it's a threat. But, and we should fight against it. But the, the trend today is to build a network economy where we understand that it's better to have a team spirit, to work together, that we are better to uh, do some things. And what is fascinating is that technology is not anymore a technology of individuals. Look at just one, two, of, two examples. One it is, which is always, for me, fundamental, which is music. Music today has invented the peer-to-peer, -peer, and the peer-to-peer -peer is everywhere. We, we do music together. The second is, what is the core of individualist society? Car industry. The car industry is dead worldwide. Who wants anymore to have a car? Nobody. People have begun to realize that when you have a car, you use it three, years, three hours a day. But it's better to rent a car when it is needed, and when there will be self guided cars, it will be easier. Therefore, the, the, the symbol of narcissism, individualism, is dead. The, the, I will take your sentence about, about states using for the car industry in other states. They are dead, but they don't know it anymore. No, not know it yet. And it will be another problem, but we are not anymore in that world. And fascism is nostalgia of that moment. If we go, if we are able to go beyond the threshold of that nostalgia, we have a wonderful world of altruism coming. And Europe is the birth of it. Well, both of you, the last, or two last questions. Um, because time is gone by. Um, should intellectuals express more ideas, more debate about, well, Europe, or each kind of Europe you, you mentioned, but should intellectuals take their place, more, take more place in the debate that they do uh, actually? Rob Riemann. Okay. Jacques will now hate me, but... Um, <laughs> I don't think there are many intellectuals left. Mm -hmm. um, he's one of the few. Um, and I also disagree with him. On the, no, the, the, look, the, again, the thing to be understood is that something happened in our set of values. At the very moment you understand that, you also understand why, what is happening with our education. You then also understand what's happening with our media because, you know, it lost quality in an enormous way. It became... I shall keep silent. <laughs> yes. Uh, and this is also the reason why we lost our small magazines and why there are much less public intellectuals. Um, yes, well, of course, we're filthy, and everybody can do the, the exception to the rule thing, you know, but I know people who this, this, and I know whatever. But it's, quote, unquote, not the global trend. The people, Shaq, referring to, you know, they may be the hope for the future, but they are not the global trend. And, uh, uh, and, and they are still not empowered, you know, to change the world, to get rid of the elites which are now running us, this Davos bunch or whatever. That's the thing to be done. If we really want to make uh, fundamental changes, um, we will never compete, I guess with America or China in terms of technology. But what we have to understand, and again, it was there as well in that nightmare. Um, you know, this obsession, also coming from America, everything has to be smart. We need smart technology, smart cars, smartphones, smart defense. Nobody of those people is talking about wisdom. None of them. They are not interested in we have to take these, again, we have to give back the meaning to words. We, we have to think what democracy is all about. We are not living in a democracy. What's going on now in America with the uh, presidential elections is a joke. It's a complete joke. I mean, it's money and it's a bunch of idiots. So, if, if that's presented to the world as democracy, of course the world will say, well, you know, China will say, well, we know it better. 
We have to give back meaning to the words. We have to understand what the dignity of life is all about. We have to understand what really unites us. And then we have to remember what, the, what Europe was all about. And the whole tradition of Europe, indeed, was not being the best or the richest or the most technology, but it was about presenting certain moral values. Are we now presenting those moral values? Even Jacques will not believe that. Mm -hmm. Jacques Attaline, in some conclusion words? Yes, we are. Better than anywhere else. Yes, here in Europe, we have human rights, we defend human rights, we are caught for human rights. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's much better than anywhere in the world. Look at only the, the criteria of death penalty, which is a very simple criteria. Death penalty doesn't exist anymore in Europe. It's the only place in the world where it doesn't exist anymore. We are pioneer on many fields, and we still are, and we still will stay. I do think that we have to be proud of our values. We have to defend them, and we have to build on them. Uh, I don't think that uh, scholars are behind us, and that we are the last of Americans. Of course not. I know thousands of wonderful, promising scholars of 20s today. Thousands. Not dozens, thousands. And what we have to do is not to be uh, pessimistic or optimistic, but we have to be uh, the players of match. We are not spectators of it. We play the match. And if we play the match, we have to be proud of our team, which is the European team, to think that we have a goal, which is to defend and promote and develop our values, which is the, uh, what I call free altruism, uh, the mixture of altruism and freedom, and build on that, and I'm sure that we will survive on that. I am not sure that we will avoid a tunnel of darkness. If I have to bet, I would think that we will not avoid a tunnel of darkness. But we can still avoid it, and after it, there is light. I think we could resume it with, yes, we can, no, we should. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen.